It is my great honor to introduce uh, Sid Srinivasa. Uh, Sid is an IEEE fellow and the Boeing and Dodd professor in the Paul Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, where he directs the Personal Robotics Lab. Sid is a full stack roboticist with the goal of enabling robots to perform complex manipulation tasks under uncertainty and clutter with and around people. To this end, he has built several robots, including Herb, Ada, Chimp, Musher, and has written software frameworks such as OpenRave and Dart, uh, but also best paper award-winning algorithms such as uh, Chomp, BitStar, Legibility, uh, that are used extensively by roboticists around the world. Sid received his PhD in 2005 from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Besides being very academically active, uh, he's also active in sports. So he's played badminton and I think recently a lot of tennis or maybe not a lot, but some, some of it. Uh, and uh, he he's a fan of Roger Federer, I saw. So I'm, I'm very excited to, to see that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, Sid, uh, take it away. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be speaking here to you all. Um, Chris, if you don't mind just giving me like a two minute warning just so that I know when to wrap up. Uh, I, I wanna be respectful of time, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm gonna to talk about some of the work that we've been doing as part of the Curious Minded Machine um, program uh, funded very generously by, uh, by Honda. And um, I'm going to focus more on just a very small sliver of the sort of broad amount of work that, that's been going on on our side uh, on perceptions and models of curious robots. Um, of course, um, please do feel free to put questions in chat and other things, and we'll make sure that we get to that uh, as, as fast as possible. Uh, and I'll also start citing uh, the different people who worked on these as we go along. Uh, the talk today is really about curiosity, but um, curiosity is, has fascinated me for the past few years uh, because um, it's very, very hard to define what exactly it is. So, so let me let me take take some stab at like my own interpretation of it. And of course, everyone's interpretation is different, and that's what makes curiosity so uh, so fantastic. Um, I have so many puns on curiosity now. Um, but I think the way I've been thinking about it is, um, and this is fairly consistent with the historically how I've been thinking about uh, algorithmic human robot interaction, is that uh, a robot performs actions um, based on some optimizing some long term reward, right? So here, this is just sort of your optimal policy, which is um, the max over expectation of the reward that you're accumulating. And of course, all of these details are important. Like what is the expectation taken over? What is the reward? How is it defined? All of that. And very important for curiosity, at least to me, is that a human is observing this behavior uh, of this robot and wondering what's going on, right? Um, and so I think for me, the human interpretation of robot behavior is critical for how we define things like curiosity or even the things that I've done in the past, uh, defining legibility or trust or, or even adaptation. So I'm, I'm gonna state one tenet that, that I believe in, which is uh, if there's no one watching you uh, and, and if that no one, if that person who's watching you could be someone external, an observer, or even yourself, you know, we often watch ourselves uh, then there's no curiosity. So curiosity demands, uh, just like legibility or trust or adaptation, demands the existence of uh, some observer uh, who is interpreting the robot's behavior. So robot behaves, there is emergent behavior that is human interpretable as curiosity. Um, I also want to talk about curiosity in the continual learning context. So this is a little bit more, slightly more technical. Um, in our lifetimes or in the robot's lifetimes, uh, it has a history of interactions that it's had in the past, a present 
which it is currently working in, and an uncertain future of possible future interactions it could have, possible scenarios. And I think one way of interpreting curiosity might be to introspect the past to help the present. We're in the present now, but we use the scholars that we've developed uh, from our history to really help us guide how we want to behave in the present. And in many ways, we are seeking um, things that are familiar to us uh, and searching for things that we may have encountered before in the present, such that those behaviors in the past can help us in the present. So that sort of seeking behavior might be interpreted uh, interpretable as curiosity. But also I think, and, and this is um, sort of more related to the cognitive science uh, thinking around, psych, uh, around curiosity, which is we want to explore the present uh, not just to help solve the problem, but since we are sort of integrating over our lifetime, this goes back to the expectation I was talking about uh, in the previous slide. If the expectation is over the present and the past, well, then you're just trying to figure out how best to work in the present. But if the expectation is over our lifetime, uh, then what we're doing also, and this will fall out of the mathematics of the interaction, is we're exploring the present to help our future. Right. There's future SIDS who are probably going to be doing various things. And, and as Chris pointed out, like I've been playing a, a lot of tennis, not as much as I'd like. Uh, and I often do things on the tennis court, and I'm sure you do too, uh, in whatever sport or other activity that you're in, that are not necessarily to optimize my present, but to optimize my future. Maybe I want to, you know, see what the you know, what, what the wrist lag, what, what increasing the wrist lag in my forehand would do to my top spin, right? Uh, and that might not necessarily be the right thing to do here, but hey, it helps with your SID. Um, so that's, I, I think that both of these are important for trying to interpret how we're exploring curiosity. So I think the, the two questions that the, the sort of our team has been exploring in terms of curiosity have been, how do in humans interpret a curious robot? And this I think is actually incredibly important. We as roboticists tend to produce behavior, you know, either via intrinsic rewards or via, you know, other methods. Uh, but we never ask like, how do people, what do people think of it? Do people think of this robot as curious or do people think of this robot as being skittish? So uh, regardless of the mathematics of how you're producing behavior, if the behavior is not interpreted as being curious, uh, you may have succeeded at publishing a cool paper, but you have failed at building a curious robot. And I think the second question is, how should a lifelong learning robot behave such that it can exhibit curious behavior? I'm actually gonna focus only on the first question for this talk, because I actually think that is the most interesting question. Uh, I'll give you a few vignettes into the second question, but actually the first one is the most important. And you should also think of this as a uh, companion talk to Leila Takayama's talk, who will be speaking later today. So I'm giving you a forward pointer to her talk. Leila, Maya, Dieter Fox, Maya Chakmak, Dieter Fox, and I are collaborators on this um, Curious Minded Machines program. So she will talk about a different perspective on how humans interpret curiosity. So please do uh, listen to her talk as well. And hopefully we're not too contradictory. So let me talk a little bit about how humans interpret a curious robot, or at least our, our experiments and studies around that. And I want to talk about one specific paper. Um, and the, the lead author on the paper is Nick Walker. Um, I hope he's here so he can answer all the tough questions. Um, but let me give you my sort of short summary of this, this particular paper. Uh, this is published um, at HRI, the HRI conference uh, last year. So let's consider this scenario. There's a human um, and they ask a robot to do something. Maybe they tell the robot, hey robot, go fetch me an apple. Now the robot, like any good robot, wanders off to go fetch you, hopefully your apple. We've all built robots and we know that, you know, with finite probability, it'll not do that. 
Um, and as it wanders on, it sort of stops by the recycling bin and sort of stares at that for a bit. Now, if you're like me, uh, you're starting to sweat a little bit and you're starting to think, what is going on, right? Uh, and is the robot incompetent, childish, distracted? So many emotions. But at what point do we think that the robot is actually curious, right? Uh, and that was the, the study that we wanted to conduct, right? Uh, let me give you the details of the specific scenario that we're looking at. The human tells the robot to explore the contents of a particular bin. Let's say it's bin E here. And the robot comes back and says, ah, there's this object inside the bin. Of course, I'm only showing you the cartoon, but we ran studies with a real robot, uh, which was interestingly called Curie, which is this adorable robot built by Mayfield Robotics that we have a set of. So a robot comes back and tells you what it is. So at this point, the robot wanders off, does its thing and comes back. Now, of course you can have some sort of reinforcement learning uh, setting where you can say, well, if you go to the goal and tell me what it is, you get a reward for solving the goal. So this is sort of purely goal seeking. But you know, if you wanted to provide it with uh, you know, what's now commonly called an exploration bonus, so a bonus to be curious, um, you can say, well, I'm gonna add an extra reward and say that if you explore some, some other bin along the way, I'm gonna give you some reward as well, right? So you can reward shape as you wish, but essentially you are incentivizing the robot to go wander around. Now, of course, depending on how you shape the reward, it could wander around one or two or many of those bins, right? And so that's the, the behavior when you add this sort of uh, this exploration bonus or curiosity bonus, uh, as you've probably seen in some of the papers in this workshop already, right? So we asked the robot to go to E, it goes to E, but then also goes to D and comes back to you, right? So that's uh, a possible scenario. And then what we did was we wanted to ask, we asked our users, um, how do you rate this particular robot? And we were able to bend that into two classes. One is competence, how competent was the robot? And the other is curiosity, because we wanted to explore the tension between competence and curiosity, right? Because curiosity certainly comes at the cost of competence and, and vice versa, likely, right? And we also had some open-ended uh, responses that the users could give us. So here's what the users were able to look at, right? In the first scenario, which we call the control, uh, the robot is asked to go to E, it goes there and comes back and tells you what the contents are. So here the robot is very task driven. We created one scenario where the robot is asked to go to E, it goes to E, but also goes to a different bin and comes back and tells you the contents of E. We'll call that distance one. We created a third scenario where the robot goes to a different bin, H, which is further away from you know, bin B. So it is, you know, seeking curiosity or seeking this sort of reward seeking behavior even further out. And then finally, we had a scenario where the robot looked at a different bin before it went to its assigned bin. So here it is, um, um, you know, we're changing the order by which we are um, exhibiting the curiosity. And then we judged it based on a competence scale and the curiosity scale. So here you see the distribution over the responses. And the responses go from left to right, which essentially goes from sort of not competent to competent. Um, one thing that you see immediately is that the, um, the robot that deviates from its path is seen as uh, less competent but seen with some significance as more curious, right? Um, the increasing of the distance doesn't particularly significantly change the perception of curiosity or the competence, uh, but certainly decreases the, the level of competence without, without significance. And likewise, whether it was done before or after, the robot is seen to be sort of equally curious and equally less competent than the control. Note that 
all the policies and all the examples where the robot deviated, did an off-task action, were significantly less competent than the control and significantly more curious than the control. So that was nice. So that was sort of a, um, I, I don't think we were deeply surprised by that, but it was just a bit of a validation study. Um, and here were some of the open-ended responses, right? Um, of course, uh, people were concerned uh, that the robot might have been distracted, but really, I think these all, um, you know, point to two main factors, right? People either felt like the robot was malfunctioning, um, and or the robot demonstrated agency. Now, this agency could be seen as positive or negative, right? The agency is great because it's taking initiative. The agency might not be great because, hey, maybe you don't want a robot to do things that, uh, that are off task. I think that the um, positive comments came around inquisitiveness. This again is around agency of like, hey, maybe it was inquisitive about its environment. Um, and of course, the, uh, the robot that was performed the control study, it was, it was clear to some of the, the users that uh, the participants said, hey, uh, look, it's wandering along to all these other boxes along its task. Why didn't it just peek in there? What, what, what's up with that? So, you know, people, people's perceptions are different about whether they want their robot to be curious or not. But the sort of key takeaway was that curiosity comes at the cost of competence, at least in this study, right? Um, and, and again, that was sort of justified there. So um, now the question that we asked was, uh, if the robot does take an off-task action, but somehow is able to demonstrate future utility, right? So this is getting towards the explainability of the robot's own behavior. If it could actually say, say something about the future utility of what it, what it did, would it be perceived as more competent or not, right? And again, we had the same distance scenario, but here we added a little twist to it where we basically said, here's what the next task the robot would perform, right? And so the robot not only knew its current task, but also potentially knew that it was getting a sequence of tasks and the next task it might perform. Now, once in a while, that task would line up against the, the thing that it was curious about, but every once in a while, that task would not line up against the thing that it was curious about. So we're gonna call this the payoff scenario where it looked at something and it turned out to be the next thing it was supposed to look at. And so we wanted to compare the control against a, uh, uh, a scenario where the thing that it looked at was not the next task. And of course the payoff scenario. We also looked at a third scenario, which was, it just looked at something that was not even a box, right? So it was demonstrating curiosity, but, de but demonstrating it out of the context of even the boxes that it had. So I just stared at a random trash can or the recycling bin before it came back. Now, again, I think the, the results are re were rather interesting, which is that when the robot was able to, um, in the payoff scenario where the robot was able to uh, look at something which was turned out to be its nest task, the uh, competence of the robot seemed to be significantly higher than the competence where it stared at a box that wasn't going to be its next task, right? And of course, the curiosity, the curiosity was significantly higher in both of these scenarios against the control. And of course, when it stared at a non-box, its competence was rated to be, ah, you know, about the same as some of these other scenarios. It was taking a detour but the curiosity values plummeted fairly significantly, right? It wasn't, it wasn't seen as, as curious as a robot that was actually performing off-task exploration, but at least performing off-task exploration that the participant could rationalize as being of value to future tasks that the robot would perform. So which is, which is rather interesting to us. Um, so here people essentially largely assume that the robot was just incorrectly checking the trash can. Uh, they attributed less agency and more malfunction to this robot that stared at something that wasn't even a box. So here again, 
uh, in the payoff scenario, the interpretation was that the robot has some sort of precognitive abilities and was able to uh, really um, anticipate what the next action would be and show even greater agency. Of course, people said, ah, maybe in a coincidence, maybe not, but hey, at least it, it, it demonstrated this curiosity. So um, here we were just, uh, happen the, 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 the happenstance was that the next task would or would not match what the robot was doing. But what if we made that really, really explicit, right? Like what if the robot just sat down and explained to you why it was doing what it was doing, right? And so here again, we go back to our old scenarios as before, um, but now the robot, uh, in one, one scenario, the robot actually tells you what it saw in the other box, right? It said, hey, I saw a hammer in box B. And we wanted to ex explore that against a few other things the robot could tell the, tell the system, Like right? One was, it said, hey, I did this because I was curious. And the other was, I did this because I thought it would be useful. So here, we are deliberately manipulating the curiosity and the competence uh, variables here by saying, hey, I did it because I thought, because I'm really curious and I did it because I thought it'd be useful. So hopefully you'll think of me as sort of more competent. And again, you know, as expected, the, um, the extra information didn't change anything. People still felt like it was as equally competent or not competent. But what was interesting was that the variables that we manipulated in terms of curiosity, when the robot explained that, uh, I, I looked at this because I was curious, the people perceived it as being far more curious without a significant hit in competence. And when it said that uh, it might be useful, people perceived it as more competent with a, a little bit, but not a significant hit to curiosity. So, as the, as the, the, the key takeaway, and of course, the, the, the users and their responses essentially said, yeah, you know, at least it told me what, what it was doing. So it, 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 I think they attributed far greater agency to the robot than malfunction when it was able to actually explain what it was doing. Right? And of course, the, um, the, 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 when it said it would be useful, I think that there were again attributes of agency saying that, okay, look, this robot is actually thinking for itself, which is, which is a good thing. It is doing things that are beyond what is being immediately commanded. It is thinking for its own future. Um, and again, like uh, people were able to nuance out the difference between, because I thought it would be curious against I thought it would be useful by saying that like, look, here it's acting for its perceived benefit instead of curiosity, which, which again is an interesting, interesting thing, which, which is that if people believe that you're acting for perceived benefit, perhaps they may or may not think of you as being curious, which, which I thought was, was an interesting point. Um, but of course, there are negatives to all of this, right? Like any off-task action, uh, there's always a subset of the people who are like, why is it doing this? Like, why isn't it just tell, doing what I exactly or asked it to do? Uh, and, and in some ways, I would, I would raise this to a meta level of like, should robots even demonstrate such off-task agency or not? Like, uh, I don't think this is um, restricted to curiosity, but any other off-task agency that the robot demonstrates might also receive the same criticism of like, just do what I ask you to do. You're just a machine. So uh, what are the key takeaways from here? I think one key takeaway that uh, is uh, people can indeed attribute off-task actions to curiosity. Like, look, nobody knew, and we certainly didn't know whether these off-task act actions would be attributed as, could be attributed as curiosity. But at least, you know, I want also want to caveat by saying that we only did this study. We can only say for what, what we can only interpret what we saw in our study. But at least in our study, it was clear that people could, did significantly attribute off-task actions to curiosity. Um, and of course, it comes at a penalty to perceived competence, right? Like there's, it's essentially a zero-sum game. If you increase curiosity, you're gonna decrease perceived competence and vice versa. And of course, transparency mechanisms can certainly mitigate negative perceptions. 
right? Like it's uh, the, the more the robot is able to explain what it did, the, the less the, the perceptions could be that are negative, right? Um, and of course, like, you know, there's just so many of these actions that could be attributed as various things. And coming back to that robot that like sort of stared at the recycling bin when it was asked to get an apple, uh, maybe it did that because it wanted to know if apples were recyclable or not, right? So like, it, it's interesting that like, as soon as the robot says this, I think, oh, adorable robot, like you're so curious. And so it's the power of the explanation and the power of the nuanced explanation that I think really um, punches home the point of curiosity. And, and in some ways, I feel this exactly the same as a parent of two incredibly rambunctious kids that they often do things that I don't understand. Um, but when they explain to me why they're doing these things, and sometimes they can, and sometimes they choose not to, uh, I do often find those explanations like rational and reasonable, right? So I think uh, the more the robots are able to explain their actions and explain their behaviors, the more we would be able to empathize uh, with them. And to also attribute off-task actions as curious. So I think that's that's the key takeaway from this particular um, study. So I want to, uh, and of course, uh, please do take a look at the paper. Here's a link to the paper, and uh, uh, it is it's it's a really fantastic paper. I've, I've loved reading it. So I want to come back to the the questions that we asked before, sort of how do humans interpret a curious robot, and the second one is sort of how a lifelong learning robot should behave. Um, and I'm going to only give you the, the sort of one minute snippet of it, and I'll, I'll point you to a paper. Uh, I think I keep coming back, at least in my own work, to this particular picture. You have a history of interaction, and you have a belief over this history and uh, of what your current and what your future interactions could be. And essentially, your entire life is this, you know, in my mind, a uh, a, a, an expectation maximization over your lifelong, you know, I would say lifelong regret in my case, your lifelong regret of doing or not doing something, right? And, and key to it is sort of figuring out how you can tractably keep track of this belief and how you can tractably run the expectation over that belief, right? Like, because you're only acting for your current self um, without the future or the past, then you're just optimizing reward, right? One other point I'd like to make is if your future and your past are identical to your present, right? If you so happen to be an entity that is only doing one task over and over again, then there is no reason or, or to be curious at all. And you will not be able to demonstrate curious behavior because you're just doing one thing over and over again. So really, I think curiosity helps us introspect the past to help the present and explore the present to help the future. And key to this is actually the ability um, to keep track of belief, right? Like you need to be able to keep track of belief and um, incorporate into it belief, incorporate into your RL paradigm belief optimization, right? And, and whatever your latent models might be. So I'm not gonna go deep into this, but uh, we have some, some really exciting work on this exact topic on how do you incorporate, how do you actually do Bayesian policy, policy optimization? So take your policy optimization algorithm Sprinkle, sprinkle base rule on top of it uh, and an efficient base filter and you should be able to um, hopefully demonstrate this behavior where you are uh, optimizing not just over your past but also your, your potential future. So I'd like to end with this, this sort of one thought which is uh, in my mind, like, curiosity is really a human interpretation of robot behavior. Um, and two things to me are important in this picture. One is, sort of the belief that you're arg maxing your expectation over, like what is it that you are optimizing as a robot? And the second is, how is this human interpreting this behavior? Because without human interpretation, curiosity is sort of meaningless. Thank you. Thank you, Sid, for the great talk. Um, questions from the audience first. I see we have one in the chat. Uh, people feel free to post more. Uh, the question is, what, what's your experience regarding using people's opinions to evaluate these robot qualities? I think it's referring to the, the main studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and how does that methodology impact the relevance of the results? Um, I'm guessing that has to do with generalizability. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, also like I, I only speak first on video. Uh, so, you know, if, if people want to uh, come on video, at least I'll get to see you. Uh, I don't know if you, if you don't allow people to come on video, Chris. Th this yeah, is like was... literally like one of the few times I get to see people. So I miss you all. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a safety headache. measure, but uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yes, Zoom bombing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, the question more, I mean, I, I think the question uh, is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a meta question also about HRI studies, right? Like, I think when we write an HRI paper, we're incredibly careful about stating the extent of the relevance of, the, our, of our study, right? Uh, one thing I do want to state very explicitly is that the potentially even the physical um, attributes of the robot are going to um, modify what you think uh, of this robot. Like this robot is called Curie uh, for a reason. Um, you know, it, 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 it even just naturally and elegantly exhibits behavior. It looks like a toddler, uh, it is adorable. And so certainly all of those, you know, when you compare it to like my robot Herb, which looks like, you know, uh, yeah, a, a human crushing demon, uh, <laughs> then it's quite possible that the interpretations might be different. So I think what we're looking at is, and this is why we do sort of within subject studies, like we are just looking for, if I take the same robot, that's why we have our controls. If I take the same robot and change some of its behavior, are, are the changes that I made significantly different from the control, right? Like you always wanna have a baseline and then you always wanna compare against that baseline. Uh, now, generalizability is a great question. Like, will this generalize to Herb? Will this generalize to Ada or any of the other robots you might have? Um, only one way to find out, you should run your study, right? Like we do have a bunch of other papers that, we've, that Nick has written and we have written you know, since then that talk about the mathematics of how we might be able to generate this sort of um, curious behavior. Now, that's also, you know, I, I love using studies to validate, but I like using math to prove theorems that generalize, right? Uh, but both of those go hand in hand when you have to build robots that work within our own people. Are there more questions from the audience? We have a couple more minutes. Um, if not, I'll ask a question. Uh, you touched upon explainability. Uh, and uh, I think you highlighted the, the value of it in situations like the ones considered in the studies. What do you see the role of explain, explainability when it comes to curious behavior? Is it a necessary part or is it like a bonus? How does this inform the future work in uh, the autonomous generation of curious robots behavior, let's say? Uh, I, I think the, um, you know, I, I think, so obviously like Nick's study uh, clearly shows the value of explainability. Um, however, like I wanna uh, also assert that like I mean, when I mean explainability, I mean that the entire behavior is human interpretable, right? Uh, now, of course you could use speech. You could say, hey, here's what I did. Uh, or like we do, like you could use gestures or you could even use motion, right? Like this is one of the things that uh, I particularly love is that I just wanna optimize that argmax and produce some behavior that you as a human interpret as curious or legible or trustworthy or anything else. Right? And I think I've been, I've, I was gonna say fortunate, but I, I'll use a stronger word. I've just been very lucky that I've worked on problems where that is true. Uh, but I also acknowledge completely that there might certainly be problems where you need to embellish the, the motion itself with, further attributes, but I, I think of it as sort of multimodal signals, right? Like even when you and I are talking, Chris, like we're using all of our modalities to explain uh, how we feel. And I certainly, uh, I, I, I'm very passionate about like using motion, just motion itself to be explanatory. But I'm also, I would also like to acknowledge that there are all of these other modalities which we should certainly use uh, for sure, yeah. Um, one thing I, I will say, and, and, and this is this is like um, you know a statement that 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 may or may not be received well. Um, I, I am I am very very skeptical of reward engineering. Um, my own personal belief is that the reward is the reward. You're you're doing things sort of 
to optimize something. And it's really, and, and maybe there's a duality here that we should explore more mathematically, but it's really the expectation that you're taking it over is what produces the behavior, right? It's not the, it's not the R, it's the R max over the E and the belief that really shapes how your behavior changes. Um, and of course, in certain cases, maybe separable systems or, 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 or maybe even like linear dynamical systems, those can be dual, right? You can take the expectation, you can pull a piece out and you can turn that into a reward, but it's not generally true. And so I think we sometimes say it's easy to do reward, reward engineering. It's, I think, harder to take the right expectation or the right belief. Thank you.